Hey, and welcome to the inaugural episode of District Angling Spotlight. Uh, this is going to be a video series where we spotlight people, places, and things um, in the fly fishing industry, folks that we like, places that we love visiting. Um, we're, today we're going to uh, talk to a shop and company uh, friend, someone that we've known for a long time. Um, please tell us your name and tell us where you're from. Larry Luttrell, and I live in Castleberry, Florida. Um, also have a place over along the shores of Mosquito Lagoon in Oak Hill, Florida. Excellent. And um, what's your favorite fish species? My favorite fish species, if I had to choose a fish to chase the rest of my life, I would be chasing bonefish. Excellent. Um, what's your favorite fly for bonefish? A craft fur, clouser, pink, and white. Bead or lead chain eyes? Bead chain. Bead chain eyes. Okay, cool. Um, what do you consider your home water? My home water is definitely Mosquito Lagoon. Excellent. Uh, great place to fish. Um, any issues that you'd like to talk about on yeah, your home water? Yeah, Mosquito Lagoon um, is facing some really serious water quality issues. And basically what's happened is... We're just a couple of days beyond the 50th anniversary of the first man stepping on the moon. So Mosquito Lagoon is neighbors with Kennedy Space Center. And back many years ago, as the space program was starting to come up, um, there were a lot of scientists that were working out there on the space program. And Mosquito Lagoon is known for mosquitoes. It's got that name for a reason. And... Turns out that a lot of the scientists that were out there helping with the space program, the mosquitoes were so damn bad that they were pretty much going on strike and saying, we're, we're out of here. We're not, we can't do this. So the federal government actually took on this massive mosquito abatement program, doing a bunch of impoundments and ditches to try to control the salt marsh mosquito. And as a result, I think the number is somewhere between 80, 85% of the salt marsh that surrounds Mosquito Lagoon has been isolated from that body of water. So if you think about it in terms of an aquarium, if you have a nice aquarium with no filtration, it becomes dirty and it can't filter itself. And that's what we've got currently today is Mosquito Lagoon is an imperiled waterway that has a lot of problems because of nutrient runoff, because of anything from municipalities that send their effluent, uh, partially treated sewage into the lagoon. You've got stormwater runoff, as well as just an overall lack of filtration. So anything that lives and dies in the lagoon, we've got this mass of nitrogen and phosphates that have built up. And as a result, we're going through these really closed loop cycles of brown algae blooms. And because you get that turbid water, the sunlight can't make it to the seagrass beds and we're losing seagrass at an alarming rate. So that's kind of what we're facing in Mosquito Lagoon. I can remember 10, 15 years ago, it was like being over an emerald grass carpet gin clear water, redfish everywhere. You couldn't even figure out where you were going to cast next. And now it's pretty nasty water for the most part. Um, you get a little bit of visibility and it moves around. So you've got to, you've got to stay on top of it because with any wind, with the lack of seagrass, we get a lot of turbidity in the water and then you're, you're searching. So probably... How long do you think before the state can do something about it and get you guys back to the good old days? Well, you know, the state is certainly working towards some solutions. Um, it's going to be a long-term fix. Um, one of the biggest things is trying to get the reconnection between the salt marsh, which is the natural filtration system, and the lagoon. And that's going to take a lot of work because you have federal agencies, state agencies, local municipalities, there's a whole lot of moving parts. Um, so it's going to be a while. Cool. Um, manatees. Baked, fried, smoked, grilled, 
Um, <laughs> you know, the manatee situation in Mosquito Lagoon. Um, we have a tremendous herd, and I believe that's probably the right word to use for a sea cow, sea cow. right? Um, we've got a couple of unused, decommissioned um, power plants south of Titusville that the warm water discharge from the cooling loop back when it was actually running as a power plant allowed the manatees to stop migrating and leaving central Florida going south, which would give the, the lagoon a break. But because they created this false environment, this habitat, they started overwintering. And we've seen the numbers of manatees explode over the last 10 years. They've been taken off the um, endangered list. They're listed as threatened, I believe. But we have so many manatees that they are overgrazing. And so we've got the manatee issue with eating all of the grass along with the brown algal bloom that's killing the remaining grass. If you look at historic photos of the grass, the seagrass beds, and compare them to more recent, more contemporary photos, you can see depth wise where manatees can reach because it's been eaten bare. I've actually watched manatees on an outgoing tide with loose grass that's flowing out in the channel, like rising trout coming up and eating grass where normally they would be on the bottom eating grass, grazing. There's so little grass that anytime they have an opportunity to get any grass, that's what they're doing. Gotcha. Okay. Lots of issues down there. Um, great place to fish. Uh, definitely a place I enjoy fishing. You have a favorite type of water you like fishing. Obviously, you live uh, and work uh, near the lagoon quite a bit. Yeah. You know, th there's no doubt that my passion, my joy is sight fishing from a skiff or, you know, tailing, cruising redfish. Um, there's nothing more joyful to me than being out on the lagoon because Mosquito Lagoon proper um, is an isolated, uninhabited wilderness. Uh, it's part of the Canaveral National Seashore. It's part of the Merritt Island National Wildlife Refuge. There's no real houses out there. So when you go out there, you're surrounded by nature. And to be able to go out there and just be able to let all of your worldly troubles go away and focus simply on finding a fish, trying to figure out what that fish is doing, being able to hopefully make the cast and then read what that fish does to react to the fly that you've presented and actually being able to feed that fish doesn't get any better. Cool. Uh, do you have a regular fishing buddy? You know, I've got a small group that uh, from time to time um, I do fish with. Um, I do fish a lot by myself, um, mainly because schedule. Um, I might be off during the middle of the week. Other guys are working. Um, I've got a really good friend that we've traveled, you know, all over the Caribbean chasing bonefish. And he and I fished a whole lot together in the lagoon, but he's got a son that's just about to start college. I've got a teenager and it's really cut into us being able to keep that string going. Gotcha. Let's get into the uh, some details here. Uh, you have a favorite piece of gear? You know, I don't know that I have a favorite piece of gear. Um, other than, I, you know, I love my skiff. Without my skiff, you know, I, I'd be uh, pretty sad. Yeah. Any uh, specific gear that you secretly want? You know, I'm probably... Um, a reel snob. Um, I really like, you know, high-end reels. There's Ables that I've had my eye on. Um, when I started bone fishing, you know, I, I had a pretty bad Super 8 habit. So, uh, you know, probably some some reels that uh, that I would really be interested in picking up. Cool. But uh, I, I tend to be on the frugal side with things. So yeah. A lot of admiration and a lot less trigger pulling. Gotcha. Um, how about a bucket list destination? Man, you know, there's still a lot of little corners in the Bahamas 
that I want to go and check out. Um, I've done some trips in the Bahamas uh, to the family islands, the out islands, where you don't see a whole lot of bonefish, but the bonefish that you do see, usually singles, maybe paired up. Very rarely do you see a school of small bonefish. They're all very much bigger fish on average. So bucket list, um, anywhere that I can figure out that's like a remote lightly pressured place for bonefish. I would I would definitely be interested in going. We know a couple of places like that. All right. We'll have a talk. Um tell me your most embarrassing moment fishing. Man. God I'm sure there's plenty. Um you know I don't I don't typically focus on or worry about fucking up because it's just <laughs> something I do pretty routinely. Gotcha. Um I would say on a trip to Alaska, um we, we floated uh, the Kisaralik River. It took us two weeks to, to from when we were dropped off to, to get picked up at the, at the bottom of the drainage. And it was towards the end of the trip. And I guess you kind of get, you know, more lax and, and you, you know, you're feeling like you're in a routine. And we were coming down the river and we saw this awesome slough. We could see like silver salmon stacked up in it. And it was pretty pretty ripping through that section of river so the guy that was on the oars starts back paddling and i'm getting up i go to jump out of the front of the raft to help get us landed and when i did i got hung up and i actually went in like face first chest first you know the whole rule that we had all you know because as a as a salt guy you know with, with a bunch of guys that you know had done trips like this before they're like you know, damn it, you got to be safe. You know, if you fall down, you know, you're going to fill your waders full of water. You're going to fucking die. I didn't, but it was embarrassing. And and probably part of the embarrassment was, you know, knowing that I'd fucked up, but trying to have that prideful moment after the fact, like, no, no, dude, I'm good. I'm good. And they're like, no, dude, you got water in your waders. I'm like, yeah, not, not, not that much. And thankfully I was with a good group of guys, good friends. And they're like, strip out of your waders, change everything underneath, get dried off. Cause we got another 12 hours of fishing. You're going to be miserable. So, you know, most embarrassing, probably that, but, uh, you know, it turned out well cause who I was with. Good. Good. Um, if you could switch places with anybody in the fly fishing industry right now, who would it be? Ooh, man. Tom by. Yeah. That dude's got a pretty good life. Yeah. You know, yeah. you, you, you kind of watch uh, what Tom's put together and built over the last 20 plus years and uh, the connections he has and the admiration that everybody has for him. You know, if I could take and put the Tom by hat on, I'd be happy. You know, that means you're going to have to root for the ducks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. <laughs> okay. Because uh, he's a Beavers fan. Uh, oh yeah, Is yeah. He? yeah. He, he would die if he thought that he you thought he was a. Oh no, fan. he's. I've seen it. We'll we'll have to sit and talk. Okay. Okay. Um, last two questions. Sort of uh, personal. You know, I'm a food guy, and okay. I'm a food guy too. Favorite cuisine. I'm gonna just go ahead and throw it out there. I grew up in the South, and Southern comfort food is 100 percent in my wheelhouse. Whether it's barbecue that's off the smoker or something really good and greasy out of my granddaddy's kitchen. Your biscuit guy? Oh, for, for sure. 100%. We're going to debate that later on. And then the last one, you know, I'm a watch guy. Um, love good quality watches. Love really good looking pieces. What's on your wrist? Uh, if not now, do you normally wear a watch? Uh, I'm not wearing a watch right now. Um, I do have two Breitlings uh, at home and... The one that is usually my daily driver is a quartz model and needs to get uh, battery change. And then I have an automatic um, that only comes out on special occasions. And I'm definitely, uh, from being from an aviation family and background, Breitling is 100% my favorite nice watch. Cool. Was that passed down or is that yours? No, it was mine. Excellent. Yep. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for taking the time to sit down with us, and uh, we will uh, look forward to seeing you out in the water again soon. All right. Awesome. Bonus grizzly question. Okay. 
You can fish with, you got one day okay. to fish with anyone ever, past or present. Who would it be? Fish with anybody, past or present. You know what? I think I would really like to hang out with Bob Clouser. You can still do that. Luckily. I know that. I know that. No, he, he actually lives in Florida now. But like, as far as like fishing with somebody, I think Bob would be a hell of a fun guy to fish with. He is. I fished with him and his son one day, and you're going to have a blast. Make that contact. All right. Thanks again. See you soon.